Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome back to Play Versus the MH the MSH MHSAA <laughs> Championships. I apologize. We've got some great games to go on here today. We just finished up Rocket League. We're now going on to League of Legends. I once again and good to be your play-by-play -play audio. Joining me is not Barino. <laughs> no, it's I'm not Kios. I'm super happy to be here. It's great, and uh, you guys had a great stream before. I'm so excited to be joining you now. Yeah, and today we're going to have uh, two teams fighting off here. It's going to be Diverville and Meridian High School going to be going up, up against each other in the finals. Now, we are swapping away from Rocket League, coming into a new game, League of Legends. Why don't you run us through real quick what this game is all about? So League of Legends basically is a 5v5 MOBA. MOBA is an Multiplayer online battle arena, basically there's five people, they pick a champion, a character that has different unique abilities, and then they fight it out on the Rift, Summer's Rift is the map, and uh, usually we get some great action, it's not timed like Rocket League is, so there could be longer or shorter games, but it's uh, pretty simple, you just try and destroy the enemy Nexus, which is on their side of the map, and it's sort of like a battle uh, on the map there trying to get control of it. And although it does sound simple, it can get extremely complicated, much more so than Rocket League. So we will be going out throughout the game and trying to keep you up to speed at what's going on. For those that may be a little bit newer to the game, uh, the map will be divided into you know what we call three different lanes. So basically, it's split down the middle. going to be symmetrical on either side. There's three lanes. Like you said, there's going to be a base at the very uh, end sides. The goal is to destroy that base, but there's a couple of towers in the way. Uh, but five players obviously defending on either side. You Those are a bit, more new, a bit more of a nuisance. A bit yeah. more of a nuisance. You can build different items and get buffs to make you stronger, your enemies weaker. We'll go through it all as we you know, kind of get through it, but I want to say once again, thank you to Play Versus for putting on this event. What they've been doing is absolutely incredible. League of Legends specifically, I think this is so important because when we look at the professional scene, there's been a huge uh, kind of topic lately around amateur talent. And at the very, very high end, we're finding that we're just using the same old players over and over again. And we really want to start getting some new faces in there. And Play Versus recognizes that. They want to start from the ground up. They're getting into these high schools. They're creating these leagues where high school players can compete you know, for, you know, for prizes, they can get recognition, you know, there's college scholarships on the line, and they're really investing into these young talents and giving them an opportunity to showcase themselves on a stage. Yeah, this is one of the best events you can have around. It's so amazing that these high school players get to, you know, bond with their teammates, learn a lot about the game, but also, you know, develop skills that are going to help them later on. It's, it's really amazing what Play Versus is doing. It absolutely is, and today we'll be having a best of three, uh, you know, first to two, obviously. Um, and let's take a look at the bracket to see how these teams got here. Or I, I don't think we have a bracket. Coming up here. Okay, so as you can see, the Warrior Alpha and the Wildcats making it all the way to the finals. Warrior Alpha took down Gentry High and the Hurricanes, while the Wildcats went through the Greyhounds, who we just saw uh, play in Rocket League and Voltron. So both these teams had stiff competition to make it all the way to where they are. The top eight finalists now competing for the championship. Yeah, and these teams clearly have a lot of experience with each other and uh, playing at this level of competition. Definitely going to be experienced with um, this this type of environment as well. Sometimes playing in best of threes, best of fives can be a little bit more challenging because it's a bit longer, sort of a war of a, attrition sometimes. But they've obviously been through that. They know what's going on, and um, I'm excited to see some really great League of Legends. Yeah, absolutely. Before we get into the game, though, we have to talk about draft phase. So this is where we'll get to choose our champions, or the players will get to, rather. We don't yes. get to choose them for them. But in League of Legends, there's over 140 different characters that the players can choose to play. You can only play one character throughout the game. And both teams will get a chance to choose their characters and also ban characters away from the enemy team. So we're going to go either blue side or red side. Blue side is going to start. They will ban away three champions. Red side will ban away. Blue side will get to pick one. Red side picks two. Blue side picks two. Then we're going to go back into a second round of bans where both teams will ban away three again. And then red team will pick one, blue team will pick two, red team will pick one. So you end up with five on either side and a total of 10 champions banned away. Yeah, so the initial strategy, right, is just to 
get rid of things that you don't want to play against. So certain champions are better at certain things. They'll have certain abilities, you know, that maybe they're slightly longer range, maybe they're better at taking damage, different things like that, and you want to ban away stuff to get good matchups, basically. So your champion, you like to play against their champions because you feel like you match up well. So the strategy is really going to come in denying the enemy champions and also getting the champions you want. So there's a lot of strategy in the draft phase, and it's, it's really important to get good matchups because that makes just winning the game easier because if you have a better matchup against them, it really, really helps. And let's just talk about what we might see in this draft phase. For them, those that might know a little bit more about the game, we've seen a big shift in this new season really focused around bottom lane pressure. With the new dragons coming in, they are so effective. They add a very clear win condition into the game if you can get all four dragons and get that soul, specifically Infernal or Ocean. What do you expect to see out of these teams come draft phase? Well, there's a couple different strategies you can take now with the new dragons, as well as the new Rift Herald changes, which it spawns twice now. Rift Herald is just an objective that allows you to push down the map, take out turrets, and then the dragons give you extra stats, so it's easier to fight or recover from damage or something like that. So it's important to secure both objectives, but sometimes you'll see teams commit to one side of the map or the other. So they'll, they'll send four or five people down one side and, and try and secure that objective. So it's going to be important to, to look at those timers, see what objectives are coming up, and, and realize, OK, can we, fight, can we fight this or can we not? So decide whether or not to back off. And um, that's going to be really crucial is also the strategy within the game of where do, where do we want to be on the map and when do we want to be there? Absolutely. We call that macro, just kind of moving around the map. Um, but what champions do you think these teams are going to prioritize? Well, in the bot lane, the big ones are our misfortune. We also have the new champion, Aphelios. Um, yes. Some new champions in the support role, which are going to go bot lane with those uh, champions I just mentioned, are, are Braum, because he's been sort of brought up as a little bit of a counter to misfortune. She's still very strong, but being able to put up his big shield really going to uh, reduce a lot of her damage and sometimes interrupt her key ability. So Braum is a big one. And then... There's a lot of new champions here. We get Set as well in the top lane. I, I expect him to maybe be picked or banned in some of these games because he is very strong. There's a few counters to him, but I think that we might see him for sure. Yeah, Set, I want to talk about him specifically for a little bit. Very strong champions, as you said. His numbers seem to be a little bit overtuned uh, oh, at his a smidge. release. A smidge. Um, but notably, extremely good in a tankier matchup. So not exactly the best blind pick champion. He wins almost every melee matchup, but if you take him into a ranged matchup like a Quinn or you know a Lucian, maybe even an Urgot does okay against him. Not as good as some of the other ranged matchups, not as bad as some of the melee ones, but the percent max health damage he does and the chase down that he has makes him so difficult to deal with. However, very immobile, so ranged champions are just gonna completely shut him down. I actually don't wanna see these teams fall into the trap of picking him first. So blue side, if he's let through, I don't think he's a good blind pick because all it takes is that Lucian or that Quinn to come in through and your set is not going to have a good time for the rest of the game. I think he's an incredibly good counter pick option. Once you see that it's a melee champion that's top side, once you can get a good matchup, then you can run over the game. Yeah, once you get that matchup, like we talked about earlier, it's important to get a champion that's going to be in melee range of you because one of the set's you know defining characteristics is that he gets stronger when he takes damage you know, rapidly. So if you can avoid that by using range champion to constantly harass him and, and, and damage him over time, that sort of shuts down one of his biggest strengths. So it's definitely important. Top lane's going to be key, um, and, and that's set. I think that a lot of the draft may revolve around him in terms of the top side of the map. Absolutely. And then down there in the bottom side, you already talked about Misfortune and Ophelia. There's a couple of other champions that have been very strong. Is the Caitlyn, the Lucian, really just talking about bottom lane pressure. If you can get an advantage early and allow your teams to get those first couple of dragons because you have that pressure um, and you can just rotate faster, you can set that up into those souls that we talked about where those, those can just be game deciding at this point. Once the game gets to you know 25 to 30 minutes, if you can get four dragons, the amount of power that is instantly pushed into your team is just incredible. It can either solidify a lead into an almost guaranteed victory, or it can turn a loss on its head in just a moment. Yeah, it's, it's going to be important to secure that soul, and it's also going to be an important decision in draft. Like, what do we do in the jungle? Because as you said, getting ahead there in the bot go. lane early on, well, Rek'Sai, Jarvan, two great champions in the early game, Olaf as well, and a lot of his counters aren't very strong right now. So those three champions are going to be big in the jungle to try and get pressure around the map, but especially bot lane for those dragons, who and most of them are pretty good at soloing it. But there also might be a decision like, hey, we're not going to put pressure down bot lane. We're going to play safe. We're going to pick something scaling jungler, maybe a Karthus, who's still very strong if you can get these items together. So there might be a decision to play a little bit slower, especially if that suits these teams a bit more um, in the match between the two teams. Um, so it'll definitely be easy, interesting to see where they go with that in draft. And it may, you know, change game to game, but I'd expect as well, you know, some decisions to be made there. And that will result in whether or not they actually make plays bottom lane around the Dragon or Rift Herald in, in topside. 
And let's talk a little bit about the jungle because it did change a lot this season, as it s seems to do every, every season. E every season. <laughs> um, but we see a big shift in the priority of the junglers, where last season it was, you know, there was a fair amount of ganking, but it was really focused on farming early. You get the early game farmers like the Shivana, like the Udir, uh, were very strong. But now we've kind of seen this shift where levels one to three is where junglers are easily the strongest members on the map because of the instant burst of experience they can get get to level three very quickly and in fact the rest of the map but they start to get less effective as the game goes on because there's less gold and less xp in the jungle so we've seen a big shift to actually just ganky yeah there's a lot less experience in the game overall as well if you're sharing xp in a lane you, you split experience um, but in soul lane you don't so you actually get much much higher level earlier on which is, is a big advantage for soul laners here but especially like you said in the jungle Early level three, early, you know, that means a lot of ganking. That means it's why Rek'Sai, Olaf have come back a little bit um, recently because you can get that quick level three. Um, and so it creates a, a big decision in, in the early game. Like where, what lane am I going to pressure? As you said, bot lane's a common one, but sometimes you go up top lane and it forces the team to play around that more. Ward earlier on to make sure they keep track of the enemy jungler. And it, it's really a thorn in your side. If you can't keep the Olaf, you know, away from your lanes, it becomes right. really difficult to deal with just that, that that's 1v1. That was supposed to be 1v1, and it becomes a 2v2, and it's really, or 2v1, there's not much you can do. Yeah, and uh, that solo lane experience is where some of these games are really going to be decided. Talked about how if you share a lane with somebody, which down in the bottom lane we do usually see what we call AD carries and supports. AD carries do a lot of damage, but they are very weak in comparison to kind of trade off. You know, don't want to have best of both worlds, just be a little too strong. And because they're a little bit weaker in the health pool and how quickly they can be taken down, um, they usually have a support along with them to keep them safe or set up plays. Now, looking at the top and mid lane though, those are solo lanes. You get all the gold, all the experience. We already talked about the soul, the top lane a little bit, but let's talk a little bit about the mid lane and what champions we could expect to see there, or some strategies we might see. Well, mid lane meta is actually quite wide open right now, at least compared to some of the other lanes. Diana, who's actually a new rework champion coming back, I think she's pretty good right now. Akali's still hovering around, so there's a couple interesting you know, assassins being played. There's also some mages that could potentially play Cassiopeia while she is not as strong as she was a little while ago with uh, the old Conqueror. She is still very, very good. Rise as well. So there's a lot of, there's actually a lot of champions, and one of the biggest lanes right now is, is mid lane actually and there's, there's so many options there and sometimes you'll have players with a certain specialty maybe they really love Oriana and want to play a team fighting composition um, you know and, and use that big shockwave there's a lot of options there obviously you know playing around the matchups there is important too but I think that mid lane may be our, our most varied role yeah and I love that it can just affect the rest of the map as well you know a really great hallmark of a great mid laner is Yes, you can have those carry performances on things like the Cassiopeia, the Orianna, the Rise, those late game skilling champions, but can you also play the roaming game? Can you pick up a Lissandra? Can you pick up a LeBlanc? Can you pick up a Talia and start to affect the side lanes, get an advantage for yourself, and then spread that advantage across the map? Because I think a strong roaming mid laner is something that can crack a game wide open. Yeah, the roaming can be huge. Coming up with your jungler and moving down to a lane, making it a 4v2 basically guarantees you get something out of that play. And that's it's so powerful if you're a champion like LeBlanc. I think she's one of the best ones you, you mentioned a moment ago is the LeBlanc because she can get over walls very easily, get, you know, take unexpected routes like the Rek'Sai. If you, you combo those two champions together, it's, it's incredibly hard to stop. And sometimes your bot lane is just at their mercy. And also because the laning phase is just extended with the bulwark being added to the turret plates so that the turrets fall a lot slower, at least the first ones, it has extended the laning phase, giving those roaming champions more time to roam because laners are locked into their assigned lanes. Um, and so there's more opportunities to create around the map. Yeah, and it's it's incredibly important to get those playing as well because while you you know if you do leave a lane you can get something big you can also punish that play by moving down your lane and taking those planes away they give you extra gold which allows you to get ahead of that champion so every time you roam it's it can be incredibly impactful but there's a slight risk there if you you know don't get a couple plays off all of a sudden you fall behind in that one v one matchup which you thought you were doing well in all of a sudden that turns around so you got to be careful with those roams but they can be game deciding as well. Absolutely. And kind of the last role that we haven't talked about, you know, just going down the list, we've reached the end of uh, the support now. We've talked briefly about the Leona and the Braum. Braum emerging as a counter to the Misfortune. Leona kind of an augment to it. What other supports might we expect to see? So Rakan's still hovering around the meta a little bit. His powerful ultimate, the quickness, is still as amazing as ever. It's still a little bit tough to use sometimes, but if it does get pulled off, especially with a combo like Misfortune or Varus, someone who can follow up really, really well, it can be devastating. Tom Kench, 
I've seen a few people play it. Nerf to the ground, but it can still be played in certain situations um, every once in a while because that Devour, and, uh, as well as the ability to move across the map quickly, can be very valuable. So especially Varus Tom Contention lanes are still a thing. They're very uncommon, but certainly can be done. And Nautilus, the last big one, he's, yeah. well, he's big literally, but also <laughs> he has that, that big anchor that can hook someone in. And once you get someone there, it's pretty much lights out. Yeah, and really where I've seen Tom Kench coming through, it's interesting that you mentioned him, is when teams are trying to sacrifice the bottom lane, you know, because a lot of teams give priority over to the bottom lane. They want to get those misfortunes, those Leonas, those Jins, Lucians, Ophelius, anything else that is going to have lane priority because dragons are important. But what we have seen from the new dragons coming in is actually the first two dragons have severely dropped in value. The value you get from just a single Drake and not getting the stacking means that individually an Infernal Drake's giving you maybe four AD, <laughs> Sometimes five it feels AP. Like that. A Mountain Drake's giving you maybe 10 armor, like not even close to a cloth armor's worth of stats. It's when they start stacking that you really get those priorities. So a lot of teams will, instead of grabbing priority, They'll grab a strong top lane and a mid lane, and they'll say, hey, bottom lane, you're playing Varus, you're playing Tom Kent, you're playing Senna. Yeah. Like, just stay safe for the next 30 minutes. Don't give up too much. We're going to go dominate the top side, and we'll give up those first two dragons, and then we'll come back later once we can get our strong solo laners into the fights, and we'll just pick up the next four. Yeah, that, that's, that's a big thing, too, is just taking the dragons later. The only real... Uh, a dragon that's very good in the early game is Ocean. Yeah. Not not as great as it once was, but it's still very solid getting that Cloud sustain. as well is a very good standalone yes. dragon, just getting that 10% ultimate CDR. I'd say those two are probably the best standalone dragons, yeah. but you know, Cloud, not the best soul. Yeah, it's sometimes you can get the, the Cloud early on. If you have a champion that really likes ultimate cooldown like Karthus, it can be incredible because you get so many more off and it, it just really, really helps you. Um, but yeah, top side, sometimes people do rotate up there um, early on to go take that Rift Herald, which spawns earlier now. And once you get that, we can knock down those planes we discussed earlier, get more gold and get ahead of the enemy team that way. So there's a couple different strategies you can use playing to one side of the map or the other. And sometimes that gets decided within a game because something happens early on, maybe an invade or something. The map gets split. The junglers just can't go somewhere. So they're right. Well, we got to play to this side of the map. And so sometimes, you know, the jungler has to you know make decisions on the fly. It'll be interesting to see what we see in game one is these teams are going to be feeling each other out. Opposite sides of the bracket means they have not gone head to head quite yet. So we're going to have to, you know, kind of have a learning process for both these two teams. I expect they're to be a bit of caution in game one, or perhaps we just flip it on its head and we just go extremely aggressive. What these teams decide to do and how they decide to play is going to be such an interesting thing to keep an eye on. Yeah, sometimes if you just don't get the, let the game get to late, it just makes things a lot easier. Sometimes you yeah. want to go with that simple, just get an Olaf and just run at the enemy team. Makes things a lot easier. You don't have to make as many decisions. So that may be a strategy, especially in, in game one. Sometimes the nerves get to you. So there might be a decision to go with that early on, but sometimes you want to feel it out. We'll see what these teams go for. And nerves is going to be a big part of this. What team can overcome the pressure? Because this is a pretty high stakes match. This is the finals. One best of three series, three games, potentially just two if it goes one side. Um, and there's, there's a lot on the line. I mean, this is the culmination of all the work that these teams have put through for an entire semester in these, you know, brand new esports leagues. This is the second year this has been a thing. And you know that they want to represent their schools well. I mean, this is something that they're passionate about. They finally get to compete in an area that they're excited to compete in. And this can go much further than, you know, just the high school level as well. There's opportunities afterwards, but this is where it all starts. This is where you get your uh, experience. Play versus is what has set up this amazing stage for these players to actually do. And you can see now that we're in draft, both sides will get a chance to ban away three champions, and then we will go down the list and pick five. Yeah, so like we talked about earlier, getting a, a jungler for your first pick can sometimes be really great because it allows you to get some pressure on the map early on. That Olaf, that Rek'Sai, the Jarvan can sometimes be really, really big. So I think that that may be a decision to go for early on. You could also just try and get you know locked in one of those bot lanes like you talked about. Those are some powerful champions as well. So there's a couple of different options here. Already starting off here, it looks like we're going to get rid of some of the champions we also discussed earlier on. Yeah, the Akali, the Mordekaiser are going to be taken away. Both really strong top lane. Uh, picks the actually both from the flex in the mid lane as well. So these seem like more targeted picks. We talked about a lot of the meta, which is what we define as like the widely accepted optimum way to play the game. There are champions that people see as stronger than everybody else, but the flip side of that is perhaps a player is really good at playing one champion, and they might not be widely popular, 
but they're just so good at playing that champion that they can make them work anyway. That's what we call pocket picks, or just you know personal favorites, and that could be what we see targeted here. Yeah, so some of these champions definitely are pocket picks, as you said. Uh, Mordekaiser, Akali, very, very common, but the Annie, um, not so much. So it's definitely, you know, they've got a read on the enemy team here and know what they want to do. It looks like we might have one of the champions we talked about earlier, Aphelios, picked up early on. We'll see. Um, but the Echo, big flex, like you talked about, can go a lot of different places, the jungle even. So the de teams are definitely sort of trying to crack down on some of those flex so they know exactly where all the champions are going to be. Meridian picking up that Aphelios for their bottom lane, and Diverville going to fight back with the Aatrox and the Swain. Aatrox probably going to be going up to that top side. Very strong laner. Interesting that they decided to blind pick it. There's a lot of things set included that do very well into the Aatrox. He's sort of fallen out of favor of the meta. And Swain, a really good flex pick that can go all around the map is Meridian. They actually just locked in Misfortune. Yeah, so this looks like a bot lane misfortune with a mid lane Aphelios. Aphelios can sometimes function in the mid lane because he has decent range damage and generally fares pretty well in those lanes. So we'll see where they go, but that's that'd be my sort of guess there. And now one of the Olaf counters going to be locked in here. The Trundle, not seen very often. He's very weak overall. However, he's great against the Olaf, being able to interrupt him and shut him down. So uh, I like how these teams are definitely adapted to each other. A lot, of, a little bit of trickery going on here with the Misfortune and Aphelios swap. So I really like what, what they're doing. And it looks like, um, you know, the Aatrox blind pick, as you said, a bit risky, but it can fare well. And especially, you said, pocket pick could be important as well. So I think these teams are picking a little bit of comfort, but also trying to counter what each other are doing. Is that an Aphelios ban? Looks like we might, yeah, it might be a, a <laughs> slight error there. Um, Aphelios already picked Ban up, so... Fortune Ban. That, that's interesting. Uh, these teams banning away champions that are, have already been picked. We'll see what's actually going on there. Um, if these are misbans, or if the, perhaps the picks are not exactly what we see on the stream. But it is going to be the Ash locked in for Diverville. They have a very set front line. You know, with the Aatrox, with the Swain, with the Trundle. This is a tanky amount of champions that, you know, there, there's not a lot of... A lot of the ADCs are more burst. You think of Misfortune and, you know, it, it's the bullet time. But other than that, it's more burst focused. The Sen as well is a little bit more supportive. I don't know if they're going to have the raw damage to burst through this front line. Yeah, both sides have gotten pretty tanky at the you know the last couple picks here. Alawi also locked in. Senna going to be going down in the bot lane with the Misfortune there. And then another strong bot lane here. Ash and Nautilus very good together. There's so much crowd control there that sometimes you just can't move for like three or four seconds. So if they can combine that together, that'll be very scary for the Misfortune Senna to deal with, who sometimes can go down pretty quick. Yeah, and when you're looking at the 380 carry, essentially, backline for Meridian, where, where's the peel? You know, who is going to keep these carries safe? Because both Olaf and uh, the Alawi are looking to dive into the back line. They do not want to be next to their AD carries. They want to be in the face of the enemy, where Diverville, I mean, you have a Nautilus to keep you, you safe, as well as, you know, perhaps the Trundle or the Swain, but the rest of them can just easily dive into the back line and tear through this very squishy, very low mobility composition. Yeah, that is definitely a concern here, and, and Swain is going to offer so much area of denial for them, and Trundle's going to be able to keep away that Olaf. So I think I think that the draft that, that D.I. has put together is really good against the enemy composition. I think they've done a great job adapting to what the enemy picks were and really put together a great squad for themselves here and uh, excited to see what they can do in this game. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the champions have been locked in. We'll see what these teams can do with them as we are on Summoner's Rift for game one of these finals. As you can see, Diverville moving out in a five-man squad. We're spotted out there, and so they're not going to be able to get anything spicy off. Yeah, but so, I like the thought. Yeah, it, sometimes that's an invade looking for a potential play onto the enemy, but sometimes it's just a war to get information. If you can get information on the enemy team, then you can track their jungler a bit better, understand where he's going to be, and that gives you a lot of power in the early game, being able to keep track of him because then you're not as afraid of him. So... Uh, I, this this makes a lot of sense to do. Gets rebuffed, but hey, good try. Yeah, and they didn't actually were not able to get a ward in the enemy jungle. It's actually some blue wards that are put down by that red buff. Um, so no information going over, but it's going to be a standard start. We see actually a singe coming through. So the draft's a little bit different than what we initially saw. It's going to be a Caitlyn up in the top lane here for Meridian High up against Sir Carrot Singed. Yeah, it looks, looks like the Caitlyn will actually be swapping to mid lane here. And then in the top side, we're going to have someone else here. We're going to have the Alawi. So 
kind of an interesting um, little swap there. And then Singed, obviously, you didn't get to talk about him earlier on. Really interesting champion because he actually speeds up as he runs around people. So you'll see him just zooming around the fight, running around, and that little trail he leaves is going to damage enemies. So keep your eyes on that. And uh, in the mid lane, an interesting match you're going to see too often, Caitlyn versus Swain. I think Swain is actually going to struggle in that matchup a bit here because of Caitlyn's immense range here. And then in the bot lane, there's so much pressure of an all-in. While, you know, Senna and Misfortune outrange Ash and Nautilus to a degree, they can't actually walk up that easily, that safely. Yeah, now that we are in, on to the Rift, let's talk a little bit about the map. You can see, hang on, Tall Fence might be looking for a hook, gonna land onto the Senna as the Ash is slowing him down. The Flash available, but it's not gonna matter. And first takedown is gonna go over to Diverville. And that's the dangerous level two spike you have. Ash and Nautilus, great CC. The slows come in from those arrows that, that Ash is shooting out there, and then Nautilus with his hook just pulls her back in, able to find that first uh, first takedown, and that's that's massive, getting a big lead there. Oh, but here it comes from across up into the top side. Sir Carrot is gonna flip him over right into a pillar, and down on the bottom side we see Silver the anime gonna fall as well. The Trundle is able to find that takedown up to the top side. Three. Zero start for Diverville. This is a massive lead. Yeah, this is so big in the early game. And it's not just these these couple um, plays they've made. This is going to sort of become a lead that's going to grow. Now that you have a lead, those next fights that are going to come in, you're going to have such a big advantage in them. And that's just so massive going forward because like we talked about, the, the objectives are going to come up um, soon in the river. Um, and those are going to be important to get. And getting those can, can, can allow you to even grow a bigger lead there. So now that you have one lead, it just sort of keeps leapfrogging itself something even even bigger. As we see Jumperu come back up to the top side, Pillar gonna slow down the allow. He just chomping away the flash forward to flip him back into the poison. Another takedown gonna go over the way of Driverville. This one picked up by Sir Carrot. Now a 2,000 gold lead just four minutes into the game. Yeah, that's, that's so big. I mean, 2,000 gold lead at 15 minutes is, is pretty good. Th this early on, it's, it's just a, a massive. It's so hard to come back from this one, especially with the team they've got. They're not very safe from the enemy diving onto them. So it's definitely going to be a concern that this lead may grow and just become insurmountable. However, they do have decent wave clear. That's not, you know, so th that could be something big for them later on is just keep the minions at bay and make sure you can get back into this game by farming up. See a big wave crash into the turret. Down there in the bottom side, Tall Fence was walking around to Ward. So you kind of stabilized here in the last about minute, but I want to talk a little bit more about why this early lead can be so dangerous. When we're looking at the composition of Meridian High, they have a lot of late game carries with the Caitlyn, with the Sen of the Misfortune that are going to be itemizing towards this crit damage where the uh, defenses for Diverville are going to come in a lot sooner. You know, it's much cheaper to uh, to build into defensive items than it is offensive items. And so come mid-game, I'm worried that Meridian High is not going to have the items needed to punch through this very tanky kind of bruiser-focused uh, composition. Yeah, at a certain point, you just can't get through all the enemy's health, and that means that they're just going to keep running at you, and eventually you'll get taken down here. And you can see... They've already started to itemize here. Just more stuff in inventory right now because of that gold lead, and it allows them to just uh, deal more damage and just take fights that they otherwise wouldn't win. And that, that allows you a lot of pressure on the map here. And it looks like all but mid lane right now has priority. And once you have that, well, maybe your jungler, Trundle here, can get aggressive, maybe steal some camps away from the Olaf, and that, that'll grow the lead there as well. Trundle Heaven getting tagged up by that stun. Flash forward from the Nautilus, the stun up Misfortune. And that's another takedown going the way of Carmel Heaven. Now 3-0, make that four as a double takedown comes in from Diabraville. And again, up to the top side goes Jumperu, just bullying the Alawi up here. He falls again, now zero in two, two and zero for Sir Carrot. This is a massive lead. I, I don't even know. I mean, this is very early to say this, but this is, looks like one that cannot be come back from. Yeah, and Olaf is even going to get pushed off the dragon here. Wanted to take that because the enemy general was topside, but now may get punished for it. That he might. He is going to get pulled back by the anchor into the waiting arms of dragon. So he will find that takedown. And now the mountain drake should belong to Diverville. 
This one going to give extra armor and magic resistance. Some tankier stats that a beefy front line that they have set up is going to enjoy very much. Yeah, this is a great dragon for them to spawn and get. And uh, Olaf actually made the correct play there. Chromo Fossa said, all right, see the enemy jungler topside, going to go to the dragon, take that because he can't be there, right? Well, they had a ward on it. They knew it, and the, the bottom lane had just forced the enemy bot lane back here. So a quick rotation from the Ash Nautilus. All of a sudden, he gets shut down, and uh, now it's 8-0, and, and things are looking rather bleak. Yeah, and the biggest thing was that they try to take that without pressure, right? You know, I can appreciate the Hail Mary play of, hey, we're falling behind on all parts of the map. We need to get something for ourselves. But... When your misfortune and your Senna have just failed, uh, you know, to have just been pushed out of lane, Carmel Heaven and Tall Fence are always going to be able to roam first to that play, and that's why pressure is so important. Yep, it allows your jungler to do things you otherwise wouldn't be able to do, go places yet you otherwise wouldn't be able to. So it's massive if you can get priority lane, especially if you're not supposed to have it, right? You know, in some lanes here, uh, you're not supposed to have this pressure, and all of a sudden, well, the Trundle does, he's able to move around and. And, and shut down that play on the Dragon. Just huge, and they get nothing back for what they lost topside. Really hurts you here. Uh, the good news is they are farming up some decent numbers there, but really the goal lead you know, kind of speaks for itself. 4,000 ahead, that's just so so big here at only eight minutes. And four of those takedowns being onto the Ash. Just shot out the Crystal Arrow. Misfortune's gonna be the target flashes and heals, but can they actually take her down? Great stun from the Senna under the turret, but Ash is unstoppable. Now up here on the top side, going to see an ultimate from the Alawi. As Singed went all in, he's found himself stuck between a rock and a hard place. Carmel Frost is trying to turn the tables, but Sir Carrot is able to pop the all, just run away. Oh no, the number one rule is you oh, never no. chase yeah. <laughs> Singed! And the Alawi just burning down the flash, plus the heal from the Caitlyn to keep her top laner alive. Great play, but that leaves the Senna down alone in the bottom lane. Gets dove, a great exhaust, means a couple more turret shots. Actually forces the heal to come through, but another takedown. Now six in zero for Carmel Heaven. Yeah, and that is the one, number one rule of League of Legends. First day you start playing, don't chase Singed. It's the <laughs> worst thing you can do. You just walk through his poison taking damage, and he's so quick, you can't really catch up to him there. And they uh, they learned that lesson again there. And now another play bot side. The, the Ash Nautilus, they, they can't be stopped right now. They're just too, too strong. Going to have probably have to give up that turret early on here. And everywhere, you can see that plating going. Singed just got, he's growing a lead. Very, very big. The two side lanes are doing incredibly well. Caitlyn is still holding her own here in the mid lane, but everywhere else is just in shambles. And we were at a 6,000 gold lead, just under 10 minutes into the game. This has been over a 500 gold lead per minute. The gold lead is increasing at a rate of 500 gold per every minute, which is absolutely bonkers. What is Meridian High going to have to do to slow this game down? So again, the good news, they have a decent amount of wave clear. Misfortune can use her ultimate to clear a lot of the minions here, but oh no, another face check in the brush. Oh, going straight on to the Misfortune, not even worrying about the Senna. Two level advantage, completed Blade of the Ruined King. There comes the ultimate, looking for the two and oh. One more auto attack will do it. A great stun there. The Nautilus is going to go gold and to keep himself alive. And a double takedown for Carmel Heaven. Yeah, again, just unstoppable there. You can see the completed item blade of the Ruined King there allows for an active to be used to slow the enemy as well. She's going to get some more damage based on their health. So a huge completion for her early on, and now a little bit of uh, brush cheese going to be coming in here trying to get them walking back to lane. Th this is just mean at this point. A little bit. A little bit mean. See Sir Carrot also being a bit of a bully up here on the top side, just running around the Alawi. Not getting hit by any of the tentacles, just just kind of standing on top where he has that Rhylize. And so there's no way that the Alawi can actually run away from that. Does not have any boots in her inventory. And here comes the bottom lane play. They've set this one up. They laid their trap. They waited patiently, and they were rewarded another two takedowns. Yeah, it just slows on slows on slows there. And then CC in the bottom lane, There's just no way to get away from that one. Well, and they didn't know they were there. There's no way to see them there. They walked through the dark part of the map there and just no way to predict that they were going to stay there that long. Now first turret going to go over a huge influx of gold now. You can see the gold lead just uh, increased quite a bit more as well. Ash, 9-0. and oh, She's just so far ahead right now. You can't No, I don't know if anyone can really 1v1 or maybe Caitlyn's got a shot, but that's the only one I can I even don't think, think of. I so. 
Well, I mean, we're looking at a misfortune that has double Doran's blade, double longsword. I think that would actually probably be the best bet, just because you have that upfront burst damage from the love tap. You know, plus being able to proc that, uh, press the attack with the Q for an early armor reduction into the ultimate. But still, I would give the chance to Misfortune winning that one v one a zero percent. Yeah, I'm trying to be I'm trying to be optimistic here, but yeah, maybe a, a perfect Caitlyn combo with the Misfortune ultimate could do it. Well, well, then I'd like to ask you if you if you want to stay optimistic here about Meridian High. And, this could just be a very unfortunate situation that they found themselves in, and maybe they are better than this. Time will have to tell. Do you think they can pull this game back, or should they just be trying to forget this one already and looking for game two? Well, that's not a great. The arrow lands here. It looks like Caitlyn is now gonna gonna get pulled back into her demise. Carmel Evan now spreading his lead around the map, looking for plays all over. Yeah, and that, w that was the last sort of big hope for them was Caitlyn. She you know, hadn't been touched yet. She was farming quite well, actually. Some of the, I think the highest score in the game right now um, next to her name. You see the 108. That's a lot of gold she's getting in, but um, you know, just gets caught out there, didn't have the tools to get away. And now, unfortunately, the, the one champion that was doing well, not so much anymore. And now the mid lane turret pressured as well. But as you said, what's the one thing they can do to come back? You just got a turtle here. You got a turtle, you know, in your base, outside, maybe your inner turrets as well, and just try and stay there as long as possible and just slow the enemy team down. You're not going to stop them, but if you can slow them down and, and clear the waves, then you can maybe have a shot later on in the game because there are some objectives you're able to steal a Baron, able to just steal maybe the Elder Drake. That's a, that's a long time in the future, but if we can get there, maybe there's some hope. So that's really the only thing they can do at this point. The lead is just too great right now to even really think about fighting unless you're in like a 4v1, 3v1 kind of situation. And I agree, you're having to look for those Hail Marys. You know, at this point, you're so far behind that it is going to take a mistake by Diverville to actually throw this game away. You are going to have to look for a great or a huge objective steal. Is it from the top side gonna to be looking for a 1v2? Allow a wanting revenge. A lot of healing coming through, but the flip does so much damage from the singe. One more W might have done it, but Jumperoo on a rampage. Not able to find the 1v2 this time around. Coming close. Well, that, that does give you a little bit of hope, though. Alawi has a lot of damage. If she can ult while a bunch of people are in there, she gets a ton of healing, ton of sustain, and she can buy a bit of time there. So maybe they can find a situation where she's able to have a big ultimate and, and uh, you know, smack him down. But unfortunately, not able to there. A 2v1, really not possible. She's so far behind, even just the Singed. Not really, not really plausible. But there, there is a chance, right, if you get that perfect Alawi ultimate. But oh, yeah, she arrows on point all the time. Again. You got to think that going up against this lane you would be a little bit more careful when you're alone. Couple flashes forced out. Carmel Heaven now burning the heal to keep Nautilus alive. Very valiant effort by the Caitlyn to force out everything she could. But eventually, the flash forward by the Olaf looking for the takedown on the Nautilus, trying to get the team onto the board. Misses the last axe. One more will do it. And finally, Chromo Frost is able to get a takedown back for themselves. They will not be completely shut out. Yeah, well, you got one back on the board. That's good for the uh, for next game. Uh, the mental's <laughs> still intact, maybe. Uh, missed the first axe, but hey, hit the second one. So not the end of the world. And and now uh, one, one takedown there. It's actually a lot of gold because when you um, go down several times in a row, you actually are worth gold, less gold yourself. But the enemy, they've you know they've had a bunch of takedowns of their own, so they're worth they they, they are worth a lot of gold oh, if you're oh, able to take comes them. Another play by Diverville looking for the Senna. Doesn't have the pillar available quite yet. Doesn't need it. Is Jumperu unstoppable now? Five zero and six, and this is a tanky Trundle building into the Cinder Hulk and just straight into armor. Wants to make sure that he can't get taken down, but he's still dishing out so much damage. Yeah, and that's that's the real big problem, is when you're you're behind, is that the enemy team can build resistances and still deal out as much, if not more damage. And once again, here comes the Nautilus. Unfortunately, the hook hitting the wall there means Chromo Frost might be able to run away, stepping onto a trap. There comes the hook. More traps under the turret, but a two-man knockup. However, the Caitlyn, the hero, of the day right now is able to find multiple trap lines. Bullet time gonna come out from the back line. Jumperu dominating as he takes out the Caitlyn. Yeah, that, that's one thing you can do is the Caitlyn's put down those traps and slowly advance the enemy team there, but walked a little bit too forward afterwards and yeah, another Ash arrow. And 
I do believe have we seen the Herald dropped yet. I think we already have. Is another fight is going to come in. Senna pulled backwards, has to flash away. There's the Swain ultimate pop. They're just diving into the back line. They have no fear of the turret whatsoever as Jumperu takes that one as much as he can. And not even 18 minutes into the game, the base is being broken. Inhibitor turret falls. The inhibitor will be soon to follow. And we're going to see super minions marching down that lane. Yeah, the, the power of this composition as well, they have so much CC and pick potential. If you walk up just a little bit too far, you get jumped on it. And the Iberville is going to get another number to add to their score. It's so hard to deal with. And uh, now that the base is broken, we're going to have super minions come down to that mid lane. Those are going to be stronger minions that are going to take more, uh, deal more damage and take more uh, damage as well. So it becomes incredibly hard to stop those. And, and this early on in the game, it's even more so. Third dragon added here and 25 to 1 the score. Uh, yeah. Like I said, got a turtle, but I don't know even know if that's enough. I think we call it at this point. 15,000 gold ahead, not even 20 minutes into the game. This seems like a borderline unwinnable. If you can pull this back, Meridian High, you forever have my utmost respect, and I will bow to you as the best League of Legends team in the world. But unfortunately, it doesn't look like this is one of their games, which does not mean that they are out of the running. Remember, this is the best of three. You still have more chances to come back. And when you're looking at games like this, in League of Legends right now, we'd like to coin a term called snowballing. It's where a small advantage can snowball into a massive one. And that is what Diberville has done so effectively this game. They took those couple of early advantages they were given, the inch that they were given, and they took it a mile. Next game around, as long as Meridian doesn't give that inch, we could see a different game altogether. Yeah, one of the, one of the initial problems they had as well is the, the way they drafted. Um, can work in theory, but it's very, very fragile. As soon as something goes wrong, it goes also really, really AD wrong. heavy. Yes, very AD heavy as well. They have a little bit of magic damage here and there, but it, it's mostly uh, physical damage, which is why you see a lot of armor being purchased, a lot Look of at armor all those items. Ninja hobbies. Exactly, and they, they, they make it even harder, especially when a lot of that damage is auto attack based. Um, for a lot of these champions, and Ninja Tabi reduces auto attacks, uh, the, the auto attack damage. So there's really everything you, everything that could have gone wrong with this game for them, pretty much went wrong. So that's the good news is it can't go much worse than this. In game two, if you maybe change some of the lanes they drafted here and put a different laner um, you know, in the mid lane or in the bottom lane, you can maybe sort of right the ship early on. And then this advantage that they have now, which is huge, doesn't really begin. And if it doesn't begin, then they have to you know, actually play on even footing. Maybe things go completely differently. Because it's really only a couple of fights that oh, one or two things went wrong, and then it just continues to snowball, as you said, into, into bigger and bigger advantages. And now the second Rift Herald going to be grabbed. Will they actually be able to get it before the Baron spawns? Yes, yep. they will. The second Herald, I believe, I didn't actually get to see where that first one was dropped. but Top I, lane play. Top lane. I, yeah, I was going to say, I feel like I saw it being picked up there by Diverville. Now grabbing the second one, looking to make another push into the base of Meridian High, this time through the top lane. Just grouping up as a death ball, they know they are stronger right now, and so the more that they fight as a unit, the more that they are going to succeed. Ash Arrow is gonna come out, hook back into the team. Alawi does best in these kind of situations. Great Senna Ultimate is going to buy a little bit of time. Bullet time raining down in the enemies, with Senna gonna be the next to fall. So far a four for zero. Caitlyn, the last man standing against the army of Diverville. Can you pull off the hero play? It is now or never looking to take down the Ash. Won't be able to do it. One more turret shot might have sealed her fate, but without any members left standing, this is going to be Diverville coming off to a very dominant game one victory. 13 takedowns on Ash alone. And uh, I mean, that was just a crazy, crazy game one. I mean, so dominant. Uh, from just one side, I, one takedown, 30 to one. That, that is a crazy scoreline wow. in any game, but in the finals, e even crazier. One takedown away from a perfect game on the side of Diverville. I mean, that, that's got to feel pretty bad to them, too. Like, yes, you obviously feel great about that win. You just came out and you destroyed the competition. They had a phenomenal game, but just one takedown away. Yeah, if you dodge that one axe, little bit they'd be looking down a perfect game to start off the finals of all things. So uh, if you're Diverville, you're feeling really strong right now. If you are Meridian High, you got to reset. Yeah, for sure. And 
The good news, we got bands. We can get rid of that ash if that's a problem. The Nautilus, whatever it is, they feel is the biggest issue. We can take that away next game, shut it down, try and go back to another strategy. That's that's the beauty of a best of five, best of three, whatever it may be, is you get the ability to come back after game one and say, hey, that was just a fluke. We can yeah. sort of figure out our strategy, reset, and, and come back stronger next game. We'll see if they're able to do just that, looking at picks and bands. Next game will be very important, but for right now, we're going to give both those teams a chance to reset, relax, and get ready for game number two. We're going to go to a short 10-minute break. Don't go anywhere. Game two between Diverville and Meridian High is coming up soon. Versus the championship between Meridian and Diverville, and we just saw a very unfortunate game for yeah, Meridian. A rough very game fortunate one. game for Diverville. <laughs> Uh, but it was a, I believe it was 17 minute stomp. Did it get to, it got to 20 minutes. It got to 20 it minutes. It did. That's the good news. But it was a complete stop yeah. from Diverville. And we're going to talk about whether you think it was a fluke, a series of just like really unfortunate events. Like maybe this is just an anomaly where Diverville got incredibly lucky. A lot of early plays and snowballed it effectively. Obviously, we don't want to take anything away from them. They played great. They got some early, early leads, and once they got those, it was pedal to the metal. They never let up. Yeah. But <laughs> do you think Meridian can come back and fix some of those mistakes? Of course they can. The, the, no game, no matter how lopsided it is, is going to tell you what's going to happen in a series. Oh, it, it, it's just best of three. So many things can go wrong. In that game, a lot of things went wrong. Just yeah. being frank about it, a lot of things went wrong. A couple made mistakes in the draft. I think Caitlin Mid was an interesting decision. It actually was one of the better champions performing, but the problem was also the bot lane got caught a few times. So they picked a, a lane with no escapes against a very heavy CC lane, so they just kind of didn't wouldn't have any way to get away from the Ashdallas once things got, started going south. And so maybe you, you decided to pick a little something a little more passive in the bot lane, try and keep you know give your jungler a chance to maybe get there before things start to go wrong. And I think there's a few things, a few tweaks. All of a sudden, that game's looked a lot different because of those you know first couple of fights. You know, you're even for as opposed to being behind. All of a sudden, they could go the other way, and then all of a sudden, you're looking at a lead for yourself. So there's definitely a lot of changes they need to make, but certainly no no game one is going to tell you what's going to happen in, in the entire series. Absolutely not. And when I'm looking at things to change for Meridian, I actually want to talk about the laning in general. There's a severe lack of wards coming through, and a lot of the early leads that were given was around the jungler. The Trundle able to get into many of these lanes and take down enemies, pushed up too far, completely unaware of their surroundings, and that was really snowballed, what, the, what this game was for Diverville. I think if the team, because like we looked at the Alawi, and she almost pulled off a 1v2, like 0-3, she was way behind, almost pulled off a 1v2, very close. I think if you can be a little bit more respectful, ward up in the jungle, know when these ganks are coming and be able to avoid them, you can really buy yourself a lot of time and start to turn these around because the team composition itself, like the champions didn't look horrible. It's just the fact that they kept disrespecting the Trundle pick. Very good ganks coming through, especially when there's no escapes, like you said, the Misfortune, the Senna, the Alawi. The Caitlyn, the only one that has mobility on that team, and it's not a lot. Yeah, it's a little bit a little bit of mobility, but certainly doesn't really qualify as a dash too much. It's, no. It was just that they picked a mobile team comp, got a little behind and couldn't escape, and then, like you talked about the laning things, warding, big. Right, the whole reason the OF got shut down on that dragon, a ward from Diablo. That, yeah. that saw him on the dragon, they collapsed on him. All of a sudden, he doesn't get the dragon, and he goes down. Wards that save lives. Wards save lives, and that's why you need a ward early. There was actually an invade by Diablo. The they were the ones being proactive in the early game. Yeah. They were the ones getting wards down. They could read where the jungler was going. They shut him down, and uh, no wards from the other side. All of a sudden, that Trundle gets an early gank off. That gets a singe snowballing, and like you said, if the Alawi wasn't behind there, she almost two v one. If she's even. That's probably two takedowns That's for her. That's a massive advantage for her. And then those team fights start to look different from there on. If that Alawi has an advantage, or is even, and you saw them just grouping up, Alawi thrives in those situations. where She's able to get multi-man just stacked in her ultimate. So much healing, so much AoE damage coming through. Um, so I really think we could have seen a different game if they just been a little bit more respectful in the early game. So that's what I'm looking for from Meridian this time around. Definitely. Get those words out early. Two minutes, 2.15 before the jungler can get to you, and then you will you can play safe, play accordingly, and, and things can stabilize from there, and then you can go into the first couple minutes of the game feeling a lot better, feeling even with the enemy team, and not get down early and you know, get a bit discouraged. Absolutely, and let's talk a little bit about Diverville and how they were able to pull off that win. Um, we kind of talked about some of the weaknesses coming out from Meridian, but the fact that Diverville were able to force a lot of those plays you talked about at the early level one, getting vision. I also think they drafted very intelligently their bottom lane was really the star here. They were able to grab Ash and Nautilus, who have a lot of CC. 
CC, we, we, what we nickname the term crowd control, for those of you who are unfamiliar, and it's basically being able to inhibit the movement of your enemies in any way, whether that be slowing them, uh, stunning them, you know, making them unable to move, preventing them from casting their abilities, really just hindering them in any way, what we call crowd control, and they had a lot of it. They had the Nautilus hook to pull them back, the Ash to slow them down, which set up a lot of the CC. Do you expect that Ash to be banned away? I, I would ban it, certainly. I think it should be done. Will it? They might have a counter for it. There, there's possibility. Ash herself is a mobile champion. Maybe they mm -hmm. draft an all-in lane to try and get her, you know, backing up instead of, you know, walking forward towards them. But I think I would just ban it away. It's his best champion for sure. It, he, he said it was his favorite champion. Like, I think you just get rid of it and, and deal with something else here for sure. Um, and then the Nautilus, I don't know if it needs a ban, but I think you need to draft something. Maybe you pull out a Morgana. Not as common nowadays, but can shut down a Nautilus because all his abilities basically CC someone. That's that's really the entire theme of the champion, and, and Morgana Black Shield shuts that down completely. So I think there's a couple changes here in drafts, certainly that could just change bot lane completely, and all of a sudden you don't have a 13 takedown Ash, and if you don't have a 13 takedown Ash, it's a lot different, that game for sure. All right, let's look beyond the draft, though, because I, I really want to highlight how Diverville were able to get that massive lead. Definitely my player of the game. Um, I think the Ash did phenomenal, but that Trundle was able to facilitate so many ganks and get so many lanes ahead so far early. Didn't touch mid a lot, but mid was re relatively stable. I don't think that the Swain really fell behind at all. But being able to move across the map so freely and get off so many ganks, I think they really need to start tracking this jungler because we saw if he is left unchecked, he's just going to tear through your team. Yeah, that, that was a great pick getting him the trundle there. The pillar was so fantastic that game. He, he ganked bot lane, he ganked top lane, and uh, that was massive. The Swain, like you said, just kind of sat there. You know, he, he just, all right, I'll farm up, I'll trade farm with you, and all of a sudden these two, these two soul lanes are so far ahead, nothing really the mid laner can do. Well, we're into game two. Draft here, five bands, five picks on either side. These two teams have swapped sides here. So we see Tyreville picking up blue side, Meridian going to the red side. Blue side will get first pick. Remember, however, the trade-off is that Meridian will get two picks to follow, and they will also get the first pick in the second round after those bands. You see the Ash immediately joining the band table. I don't think anybody's surprised. Yeah, the Ash just had to go. You just can't leave it on there. It's too powerful in his hands. I mean, you just look at what he did. Um, Karma, just amazing stuff on that Ash. Perfect kiting. Get rid of it. Trundle ban as well. I think that they're doing all the right things here so far in this draft. Both sides have done a really good job sort of changing from what happened in game one, you know, resetting, saying, all right, this is what we need to do to come back. And uh, that short break really got their minds right, and now they're ready to go. So these were, we'll see what that uh, last second ban is here from Meridian High School. We actually see the, the player names are a little bit messed up there. Um, so. Hopefully you get that fixed soon. But this next band is going to be the Jin. So really targeting this bottom side of the map here, wanting to take away some of the strong laners. They're really focusing in on Carmel Heaven because he was the man that did the most damage on Diverville for sure. It was the Trundle that set up the ganks and got Carmel Heaven ahead. But it was the Ash that really brought the team home and was able to win over those team fights. So really pitching his pool. However, Aphelios still made it. Yeah, and that's that's a big champion to get early on. He still gets a very powerful one to go I into his hands, and now on the other side, a bit of a safer, bit of a safer yeah. bot lane. Now I assume this Lux will be support. We'll see where she goes, but based on the way it was drafted, it seems like that's going to be the way. But could be flex to mid lane. We'll see here. But Ezreal, so slippery, so easy to get away on him, and uh, his cooldowns, you know, are relatively short. He can stay safe for a long, long time. And uh, Leona, that's an all in bot lane. If you do get caught, things could get a bit hairy. But Ezreal, good at staying out of trouble. We'll see if this is actually an Aphelios pick coming through, because yeah. last time we saw Aphelios and Solane, it was actually oh. the Caitlyn. Uh, Morgana going to be paired with that. Ezreal most likely going to be a Lux in the mid lane. This is a very safe team that we've seen so far. Ezreal, like you said, very slippery, very mobile, can avoid a lot of those ganks coming through. Morgana, to protect yourself from the CC, going to come out of that Leona. And the Lux, with tons of poke, long range CC, and has the the W to shield up for allies. I think Meridian are making smart adaptations to say, hey, this is a very aggressive team we're going against. Let's draft a little bit of defense, a little bit of safety, try to protect ourselves. Yeah, and certainly I think that's where Diaverville thrives. It's just getting into the enemy's face, getting on them, and, and taking the fight to them. 
But maybe if Meridian can play a little bit of a safer game, a little bit more passively, stay safe with Morgana the Ezreal, they can they can do a great job of that and just sort of keep the Ezreal away from them. Play, you know, don't play to their game, play to ours. And uh, I think the Morgana is a great pick for that. Ezreal great as well here. So I think both sides have made good adaptions. The Ezreal, well, they haven't really adapted. They've just done the same thing again. It worked pretty it well. Broke, don't fix it. Exactly. And Meridian, they've made the adaptions they need to, and I think they're gonna they're gonna be in a much better spot now. Absolutely, the Singed and the Nautilus also being banned away. The Lee Sin gonna come through, so Diver will finally shaking it up a little bit. Gonna have the Kaisa Leona in the bot side. Lee Sin's gonna be in the jungle. Akali will be in the top lane most likely. We'll probably see a Philios in that mid lane. Meridian have one last pick. It is going to be Dr. Mundo. Very interesting grab. So it should be the Dr. Mundo jungle, and this is sort of going towards a, a scaling jungler. Decent in the early game, but really the idea is you become that basically, you just can't take him down later on. Like, yeah. he's, it's just impossible. He just he's so much health, and uh, being in the jungle, he gets asked as a Cinder Hulk, which is going to increase his, his health even more so, and he'll be so hard to deal with. Trindamir, it looks like they're also going to take in the top side. A great split pusher. He gets some pressure on the map, and with a safe sort of um, core lineup. They can sort of play passively wherever he isn't, and he can sort of pressure the side lane here. And there's not really a great answer to him in the side lane, honestly. You know, the Akali can maybe do it, but really the Trinimir should be pretty much safe to just go ahead and split push and put pressure on the map. And I like what Meridian are doing. Don't play in their game. Play to ours. Play it. Play to the weak side of the map and do something with that, and maybe that can be big for them in this game too after a rough game one. And I like that Meridian are choosing a win condition for their team that does not match up with Diverville. The last one around, when we saw the, the misfortune in the Senna, their identity was they wanted to group up. They wanted to team fight, get all those big ultimates off at once. Coincidentally, that was the same win condition for Diverville. And because they had the advantage, their win condition was always, always going to win out. Let's get into the game, though, because this is going to be the do or die match here for Meridian going up against Diverville. 1-0 lead, game point. A single victory away from the championships. But as I was talking about, the win condition here for Meridian, I would love to see a 1-4 split composition coming out here. We see the Trindamir, um, who will be going up into the top lane up against this Akali, is going to have so much split put pressure late game, especially after level six, once you get access to that ultimate. And the rest of the composition for Meridian is so solid and defensive. You have the frontline Mundo, you have the CC immunity, the slipperiness of Ezreal, the protection of Deluxe. They can just sit and defend while Trindamir does all the work. Yeah, the the Trindamir really just going to try and never group. That's really, he really yeah. never wants to do it. He wants to be alone. He wants to go to the weak side of the map where everyone isn't and just start hitting those towers down, try and get to the enemy base here and knock that open as well. So that's really his only goal. The other four members, just stay safe, grouped up, clear the waves, maybe pressure objectives, do whatever they need to at the time, just do that. And, and that's sort of the, the formula to win here. On the other side though, the Iberville, same thing as, as the last game. Just go in, try and force as many fights as possible and take objectives after. They did a great job of it last game. We'll see if they can follow up here. And uh, things, you know, better. I, may, maybe I'm calling it too soon, but this is a good start. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they're two minutes in, and they haven't given over any takedowns quite yet. Now, I'll be interested to keep an eye on this bottom lane, because this is going to be a very make-or-break lane here for Diverville, the Kai'Sa, and the Leona. A very aggressive lane, especially post-6. The access to that ultimate from Kai'Sa allows her to just dive into the back line. Right now, though, Shuriken misses. Chad was falling fairly low there, as the Akali does have the advantage here early on. The, the Akali, I think, is going to be a tough lane to deal with, but it shouldn't really stop him, right? He, he can't really necessarily take her down, but neither can she really because of the ultimate as well as the fact that they're both pretty mobile. I don't know if we'll really see a lot of fighting there because it's just really tricky for both those guys. Oh, Zenith Lady is going to land, though. Ezreal going to get knocked down. Blows the heal very preemptively. Level 2 does not have access to the Arcane Shift, so not even having that mobility that we talked about unlocked yet. And now here comes the gank. Unfortunate, the Q does not land onto the Lux. The slow from the E, though, is going to get dragged back. A huge chunk of damage onto that Lee Sin. He's going to look for another Q. Sidestepped away by Silver, the anime. Great plays there. Yeah, and that's a... The, the Sonic Wave there can get blocked by minions, so a really nice use of those to protect himself there. 
beautiful dodge of the gank. Low on mana now, probably has to go back, but, you know, three, four minutes in now, we're looking pretty good. Not not a bad game two to start off with. I think they're sticking to the game plan here, play a bit safer, just kind of wait for things to go our way, and then, you know, capitalize on those opportunities. Still, though, we see a 500 gold lead for the side of Diverville. Massive CS leads in almost every lane. Uh, slight deficit, though, in the mid lane, and so the anime is about 10, 15 CS up almost, but top side, we also have a massive advantage. Uh, 25 to 9 in the bottom lane, 31 to 6. Yeah, this Lux, this Lux in the mid lane is doing really well. Uh, she's actually ahead, so that's that's great for her. And the bot lane's still going a little rough, but again, they're they're playing safe here as we Ooh, get a flash. Forcing the lane. flash out of the Swain, and he still gets stunned up on her turret. First takedown actually going to go to Meridian. Ooh, strike first, good Zenith Blade onto the Morgana. Will most likely fall one more auto attack. We'll do it. Walking under the turret, flashes forward, but gets binded. Oh my goodness. Carmel Heaven gets outplayed and is taken down by the bottom lane of Meridian, who are off to a wonderful start. Yeah, really fantastic job there. I mean, that's what happens when you get a little confident after game one. You decide, all right, hey, I'm just going to go underneath the turret. Who cares, right? Well, that's what happens when you get a little bit too overzealous, a little bit too overconfident. You get shut down there, beautifully played. They even saved their flashes. Like, that was an amazing play by the bot lane. Pretty much could not have gone any better for them. Even getting the gold onto Silver the Anime will start to close that gap. Down 25 CS, but that gold from the takedown is going to pretty much even that up. The Riona may be able to get this. Coming, and here comes the Lee Sin. The Sonic Wave going to land there. But a nice flash away from Silver the Anime is going to keep him alive into the waiting arms of I signed out. Yeah, and that was actually brilliant. He actually flashed the damage. That's incredibly hard to do. There's only a couple of frames you can really get that on. Really nice play there by the Ezreal. And uh, if he didn't flash away from the damage, there might have been a way for the Lee Sin to grab that. He has his own flash, so he could have followed and maybe gotten that, that takedown. So really nice job there, making sure he stays safe. Brilliant job now, and they're up 2-0. Like, this is night and day. You know, this is what we talk about. The snowball effect makes things look even worse than they are. But now, 2-0, this is a great, great start after after such a, a, a rough game uh, in game one. Great binding there in the mid lane. It's going to tag Dragon. Now looking towards that Infernal Drake right now. Grabbing Vision is Diverville. Yubi continues to push under this turret. Now a 20 CS lead has really been the rising star for this team. Last game on the Caitlyn was the one lane that wasn't falling behind early. Now that the game has more stabilized, is really starting to shine on this Lux pick. Yeah, and that's Lux is an interesting champion. She's a little bit more supportive, but she can still dish out a ton, a ton of damage. Especially if she gets rolling here, I think she could be really tough to deal with. And her ability to clear waves to allow the Trinimir to do what the things he needs to do is massive. So I think the pick's a little bit different than you would expect, right? Lux not the most common champion right now, but it doesn't give you kind of what they need right now. And also, you know, getting one of your best players onto this champion, a champion that he likes, I think puts them in a great position here. And after what the bot lane's done, I mean, I have no notes yet. They look so good. Yeah, just is he's falling. Oh, still a little bit far behind in that CS. Just 12 at seven and a half minutes. And now looking for the Infernal Dragon is Diverville. They know they have the bot lane priority, but the jungler is here. Ultimate from Lux, not going to secure it. That will be Lee Sin instead. Flash away. Lux is going to get to safety and not find any takedowns in the backhand, but the dragon will belong to Diverville. And th that's big, though, not losing anyone. Sure, they lose the dragon, but like you it's said, one. Early one. Yeah, it's one dragon. It's not the end of the world here. It's early one. I think that was, it's just good that they got away there. The and Lux. a lot of people actually give still a lot of weight to the Infernal Dragon because it was so powerful even as a single Drake last season. But with the changes to the Elemental Drakes, they actually individually are worth a lot less. So even later on to the game, let's talk like full late game six items. That drag, one Dragon is probably going to give you maybe 20 to 30 AP. Like it's not a lot at all. So I don't think that Meridian really loses much by just backing off there. Yeah, and there's no Vagar, there's no Jin. You're really fine to give that one up. No one skills ridiculously well. And even some of the champions, they don't buy straight up stats, right? Kai's is going to build a bit more attack speed, and Swain's going to build a bit more health. So it's not like the most important dragon this game here. Uh, you'd love to have it, but I think great that they just didn't 
go down there, and now they can sort of maintain this even state in the game, and that's really all you can ask for uh, in these first couple minutes. Yep, absolutely. Now looking to push onto this turret. As we are looking about 10 minutes into the game. It is a even game. And Rift Herald has uh, spawned as we get a play in the bot side. Oh no, looks like the Ezreal's, yep, gonna fall. Well, I signed out, able to survive, but not able to save his AD carry that time. Nope, is going to fall, and that is a massive advantage. Now looking to push onto this turret with the numbers advantage. Kaisa and Leona don't have access to that ultimate. I signed out, has to be a little bit careful. He's going to push him away. Yeah, we're well, thinking about the dive there where they decided against it. They learned their lesson from the first time they went for it, and uh, some flashbacks there, but yeah, just smart to back off. They've got on, they've gotten themselves on the board here. They've got a dragon. They've got... You know, a 1-2 score line. I think you're happy as the Iberville. Not as happy as game one, but hey, after losing two kills early, or two takedowns early on, not bad to be in this situation here 10 minutes in. Both sides, I think, are happy with this, and we're going to have, I think, a really close game throughout this one. Maybe uh, in a couple minutes we'll have a situation where one team's able to break away, but right now we've got an even game, and I think this is going to be uh, much more competitive than game one, and it'll be a very entertaining game from here. It definitely should be, and I love to see that we are that they are fighting back. You know, game one we talked about how, you know, hopefully it was a fluke, and it looks like it might have, or n not necessarily a fluke. Again, I don't want to take anything away from Diverville, but a really unfortunate situation for Meridian, and they want to prove that you know that was not the best that they had to offer. They are a finalist team, and that's what they're showing here. Yeah, and they they look much better here. The Trinimir is also doing a decent job farming up. He's he's quite far behind the Akali right now. Not a great sign. But Trinimir is not a, a champion. He, he obviously loves items and needs them. But if he just gets a couple going, then he can threaten the towers. And that's all his goal really is right now, is threaten the towers, threaten the objectives. And that way, his team can either capitalize on the other side of the map, or they just don't come to him, and he just you know takes them down. So as long as he gets a few items here, he's going to be fine. Yep, and now looking across the map, the big things that we just saw, Yubi finishes Luden's Echo. The first one to a completed item, 96 CS, has one takedown to his name, is swimming in gold at this point, and really going to be a threat to reckon with. Yep, he's he's done a great job here. He's had two good games, just a f unfortunately a few things have gone wrong. So game one, his performance wasn't really shown to, to be positive one for the team. Despite him doing a good job in lane, things just kind of fell apart before he could really affect them. And uh, now he's doing a great job in lane. Almost stole that dragon, was quite close on it, but not able to quite get it. And uh, this Lux, like I said, going to be super tough to deal with. I think it's going to be really tough for the Akali to get onto her, the Kai's to get onto her. And uh, if, he, if he continues to play the way he has in laning phase, in, in, in potentially team fights later on, or skirmishes, he'll, he'll, be, he'll be a great asset to his team for sure. Where I am getting worried, however, is in these side lanes. Yes, Yubi is doing phenomenal, has a massive lead for him. First one to a completed item. But still, if you look at the score, it is over a 1,000 gold lead for the side of Diverville. And that can be a little bit confusing because they're doing so well. But then you look at some of the CS, and that is the amount of minions you've taken down. And minions give you gold. In the top side, you have 106. Hang on, as Dragon is looking to find a fight. It might have been Sandwich. Kaisa going to ult away. Leona going to the back line. Yubi has joined the fight. And I signed out, we'll pick up the first takedown. Mundo will secure that one in the back line. And Meridian is just running over Diverville right now. Yubi is going to find another and a double takedown for Chromal for us. They just shot up from two takedowns to six. They just ran over the competition and we'll get another Ocean Drake as a prize. That's such a massive play. So big there. I, Yubi played that fight really, really well. You also have to, the Mundo in the front line. Chromo Frost, just great plays by them there. Unfortunately, they jump on the Ezreal, get him before the fight can really start, but then the three remaining members make a brilliant play and just win a fight that I honestly wasn't expecting that to happen. Wasn't expecting that to happen, no. but now I've got S Meridian look like they're actually a real contender here. Doubted them after game one, but now after the performance in the first couple minutes in this game, they look so much better and, and really look like they deserve to be here. Because, I mean, they, they earned their way here. It wasn't, it wasn't a fluke. They've shown that now. Yeah, and using that 10-minute break to its fullest, able to really just get themselves at a good spot mentally, turn it around, you know, shake off game one, say, hey, that was not us. 
that was not the best that we had to offer. And they're showing us what, what that is right here and right now. I'm still a little bit worried about the CS numbers. This Ezreal is at 18 CS, 14 minutes into the game, and you're normally looking at about 10 per minute is you know the kind of goal. Uh, so falling really far behind the curve. Yeah, he's actually shared a lot of CS with the Morgana. Um, maybe, perhaps unintentional, but maybe they're going to go and put a, more gold on the Morgana intentionally to try and get her um, towards that, that zone he is early on, because that's one of the most powerful items the Morgana can have. Unfortunately, they may be in a bit of trouble now. Zenith Blade not going to land, either will the ult. It looks like the Ezreal just barely unable to escape. And I signed out who is looking to save his partner in lane will most likely go down. Sonic Wave going to connect. Leeson will be jumping on top. And Carmel Heaven going to pick up credit for that takedown. But meanwhile, Rift Herald in the mid lane might have been popped a little bit too aggressively. Leona going under the tower, going golden to stay alive. Flashing away, but still going to fall to UB now on a takedown spree. Three in a row. 4-0 and 2 now as a double takedown comes through. And Carmel Heaven trying to find the shutdown. Will oh. eventually get it, but shut down himself as that credit goes over to Chad. UB wanted that one. He walked back in and he then did. one more order from the Kaisa. Unfortunate, but a brilliant play by him there. Looks like he's going straight um, for the... Uh, the Magician's Hat as well because he's got that needlessly large rod in inventory. So it looks like he wants to go for a lot of damage early on here. But he's hit pretty much every binding that I've seen. And he's just done a fantastic job on this Lux here. The bot lane struggling a little bit like they did in game one. But the top side of the map has done so well that it's making up for a lot of their struggles here. Um, and I think that this game, again, still anyone's really looking at them across the board. Your bot lane's behind. But Ezreal's kind of an interesting champion alongside Morgana where they're going to do their base damage, and they're going to do quite a lot, even on a little bit of gold here. And Morgana's always going to provide the binding, the black shield. So I think that they're really in a good spot and can probably win a 5v5 if they play it really well. I mean, as the idea behind Ezreal is that his items that he needs are a lot cheaper than the rest of traditional AD carries, so he typically gets them a lot earlier, and he's a strong early champion. But Kai'Sa, already on that Storm Razor, plus the Tier 2 boots, Ezreal hasn't even finished his Mira Mana. The good news is he has got that tier straight. Oh, oh my goodness. The bad news for Akali is she just got demolished. you be able to find the one combo takedown, even flashed away with the auto attack to follow is going to secure it. And that was disgusting. Yeah, that was, you know, one one rotation of spells. If, if, if a Lux can do that in one rotation of spells, you got something to worry about. Because that was, that was pretty disgusting. And uh, now they've got Pride on the top. They can probably take that turret here as they try and stop them bot as well. Yeah, taking the turret and now looking for the fight. Falling very low, though. Able to find the takedown, and that should secure the second one as well. Double for Carmel Heaven as they're just going to trade that turret in the bot side. Three-man strong stack for Diverville, or for Diverville and Meridian. Looks like Meridian is just going to back off after that play as Diverville sets up for this dragon. Yeah, so the dragon, definitely the important next objective here. Uh, a Cloud Drake, again, not individual drakes aren't as strong anymore, but picking up that cloud would be quite nice. Lux naturally has pretty low cooldown on her ultimate, but getting even more is big because she can then try and keep up with each wave as it, as it comes and just ult that, and all of a sudden the, the, there's basically no pressure on whatever lane she's in. So that would be pretty big, but Pretty much everyone has powerful ultimates on both sides, and if they can get those cooldowns lowered, that would be massive for everyone. So this dragon, well, yeah, one dragon isn't super important. In this game, Cloud Dragon actually could be very valuable. And Cloud Dragon, one of the most valuable you know, single drakes. We talked about how the mm -hmm. individual value of them dropped. Cloud Dragon, I think the individual, individual value actually rose. It went from flat movement speed to ultimate cooldown reduction, which I think is, can be so much more important. Depending on the composition, of course, I think it'll be very good for the side of Meridian because they have the high tier ultimates, the Mundo ult, the Trindemir ult, like you said, the Lux ult. So this is one you want to contest. Yeah, well, it, I mean, Cloud Drake got better because it was so bad to begin with. It, it was. It, it wasn't like, oh, wow, we have like something really, really good now versus something we, you know was just okay. Like, no, it was really bad and now it's good. Like, it was just such a big difference. And uh, that, I mean, it's massive for Cloud Drake. Happy for him. You know, he doesn't get all the love he deserves and, and now he's in, he's in the spotlight. You know, people are actually taking him when people would just leave him on the map. It's it's nice to see. Well, not going to be contested here this time by Meridian. Now Ezreal caught on the wrong side of the map. You have to run the 
Arcane Shift is not going to get him away. The hop forward, the ultimate alley-oop back into Leona, and Carmel Heaven will be the one to take him down. More gold in the Kaisa's pockets, five, three, and two. Yeah, secures that one. Uh, <laughs> didn't d that's that's a that's a gift to the AD carry. Just like, all right, guys, we're gonna we're wrapped gonna... it up with a little boast, and here you go. Yeah, exactly. We're Corral him, him in there, low as possible, and just keep him in one spot <laughs> for you. Just used one ability to grab that one. That's a good feeling. But now, now we see. Carmel Heaven, 5-3 and 2, 144 CS. Yubi, 5-1 and 3, 164 CS. Very similar in gold. We could see the tale of two carries here, the Kaisa versus the Lux. Yeah, Q QSS could be important to get. Um, that way you can get out of the binding before you know the rest of the Lux's damage comes through. But with Death Cat completed, if you get caught by a binding, I mean you're it's like the, you're not gonna come out of it. Like that's just the, that's the bottom line here. So the Kaisa. Probably strong, but if you get a little bit too overconfident like he did earlier on underneath that turret, uh, yeah, things could go pretty bad for you. So Yubi, important to keep your eyes on him. I mean, obviously, Caramel Heaven, but Yubi in these fights, who's he going to catch? Because if he can catch that Kaisa shutting him down, you know, sure, the other members are strong, but really all their gold has been dedicated to that AD carry position. And the same thing on the other side. If you can catch out Yubi, if he's the target of that Leona ultimate, because a lot of times when Lux is using her spell, she's locked in place, especially that ultimate. Gives her a couple seconds where she's very vulnerable. If you can take out Yubi, that's a majority of the gold on the side of Meridian just missing from the fight. Yeah, and I think the goal for Meridian here is just either either try and find Caramel Heaven. If you can't find him, just wave clear and hope the Trinimir can do something in the side lane. That's really the only two modes to play right now. But oh, hold but on, Yubi. I'm looking for that Lux. There's the ultimate, just going to be a slow this time around. Oh, Flash wow. and ult backwards, but still finds the shutdown. Only able to find one. They will eventually take down the Lux, but at the price of their own carry. I mean, that was a four versus one, and he traded one for one. That's You can't you can't really get much better than that. Yubi played that as about as perfect as you can. That was just masterful play on that Lux. Uh, just amazing here. And that's the thing we're talking about. He's got he's got those two items, two of the most powerful AP items in the game, you know, at this stage. If you can have them, well, Caramel Heaven didn't even get a chance to flash heal. He just got blown up as soon as he got in there. Absolutely. And I mean, you got to think what would have happened if Carmel Heroes didn't, or Carmel Heaven didn't go down. You know, they probably would have taken a tower. They could have gone for the Baron, but because uh, the Lux was able to trade that one important champion away, he prevented Dibraville from really taking and making that play so much better. Yeah, the, the Kaisa is so important for any objective taking because he, it's all of their consistent damage. So Akali and Swain do damage in team fights, but they don't actually have auto attack damage or consistent damage like a Cassiopeia does with their twin fang. So you if you want to take Baron, if you want to take a tower, Kaisa has to kind of be there unless you're gonna got like two free minutes of hitting it, which you're generally not gonna get. So you need her there, and as soon as she's out of the fight, out of the picture, back on the spawning platform, you can't really do anything unless you're just completely left unattended. Is very true. Now you can see Diverville roaming around the map. They're looking for a pick. They know they have to find Yubi. They want to make a play happen. That mid lane tier one, the final outer turret standing. Once you take that down, you can really open up the map, start moving into the jungle, getting down these wards, start pressuring more objectives. Right now, undefended with a wave pushing in. So now the, the, the goal for both teams is set up vision. You can already see a lot of blue wards being put down. The side of Meridians, they're trying to get some defensive vision, but it's really difficult to even move in the jungle, as, as Mundo can attest to. Yeah, he's getting caught out here, but that is a very tanky Mundo. In fact, it might be the Ezreal that goes down. No, neither of them are going to fall. A lot of summoners being burnt on either side, but they are going to hang on there and not get taken down. Yeah, so that's big that they, they don't fall here. And again, if they can just clear these waves, it looks like Yubi will be able to save the turret, but now he's in a bit of trouble. Looks like no. No Lee Syndrome this time. Not going to happen. They might just try to tank this turret, take it down. Leona falling kind of low there. Lux just barely not able to find that binding. One step closer, Tall Fence could be you know, back in the spawning platform. Dragon is going to spawn here too. This is where dragons start getting really important because if you allow Diverville to get to three, they will be incredibly close to that soul. It is going to be a cloud soul. 
this time around, but they are getting very close. At least they're gonna kick the Lux forward. Immediately goes Golden, keep an eye on Yubi. And he's able to take down the Kites after a great finding from Morgana. And that means that Meridian tears through the fight. A 4-4-0 trade. Yeah, well that's huge. Uh, again, they deserve to be here. They just showed why again. A huge, huge fight for them. And now nine, two, and four on this Lux. Yubi is, is just putting team on his back here. He's got some buddies with him, and he's just going to carry them to victory here. He's doing a fantastic job. And now the whole game plan for the Iverbill is kind of falling apart. The Kaisa was doing so well. Now she's not uh, in a, as such a great spot. She's gotten shut down a couple times now by the Lux. You know, what is the next play here? Because if they're the ones who can't now walk into the enemy team, what do they do? Because that's, that's all their team really does. And I think you just have to continue looking at Yubi. Uh, you know, the rest of the team is catching up. You have a 2-0-8 uh, Mundo, who is a very strong front line. This Trindamir is now 2-0-2. He's getting close to his first completed item. Bought a lot of components, um, but once they'll start upgrading, he will be very strong. And I think Yubi is slowly buying enough time to shore up for the weak early game of the rest of his team. Certainly. And, and and now the scaling is big. Trindamir is great later on in the game. Mundo is great, and Lux, you know, is going to continue to be able to pressure these AD carry, these AD carries, these squishy champions, um, with her damage. So, I don't think things like start to fall apart later on in the game here. Kaisa gets scary as well, but really, I think that the late game is anyone's. And it's going to come down to the execution once again, as all these fights do. Eyes on Yubi for the side of Meridian. Is he able to stay safe? Is he going to get taken down? If that Lux is missing from the fight, our dynamic changes completely. Certainly. Now, again, we talked about Vision a second ago before, you know, Mundo was being harassed in the jungle here. The real goal is just to get Vision on the top side of your jungler so you can get to the Baron. Right now, both sides have a few wards there, but neither side is really committed to getting it. But that's really the next step for both these sides, as that's the next big objective. You see the tournament going one for one against Akali. Akali winning out on that trade. You know Chad is baiting in that fight, knows that if Kali all ins, just pop that ultimate, get that couple seconds of you know, preventing the takedown. And this game is really stabilized right now. Both these teams just kind of gentlemen's agreement to farm up right now, get as strong as they possibly can before some of these big objectives take over. The Dragon's going to be the biggest ones right now. Both teams at two apiece. The next one will put them one away from the soul. Baron on the table. 26 minutes into the game. What will be the next big thing that will push these teams over the edge? Well, so the Baron, super important right <laughs> now. But we talked about Dragons a bunch. The Elder Dragon is going to come up in a little bit. I mean, it's going to take a lot longer, but it will eventually be here after you know a couple more Dragons. So. That could be huge as well, right? The way the game is going, it's played incredibly slow in the last couple of minutes. So if this pace is sort of kept up, well, hold on. Maybe it won't be here as Yubi, good for flash. Yubi, forced the flash, but gets knocked back. Anyway, doesn't, has access to the Zhonyas. Will he be able to survive though? The sun coming through from the Leona. Good dodge on the ultimate, and the shutdown goes once again to Dragon. Okay, well, ignore what I just said. <laughs> That's really bad. Now, because Yubi's off the map, there's a huge potential for a move to be made. Hang on, the Kaisa down there in the bottom lane ignores the Ezreal to take down the turret and then proceeds to take him down as well. Two crucial takedowns with the side of Diberville, and they are going to get so much off of this. Yeah, this is huge. Two turrets already and perhaps going to fall back and looks like they're just going to head back to base, but they could establish vision as well. Unfortunately, they're mostly out of wards here, so... A huge play there. Every time they're able to get Yubi off the map, it means that there's a huge opening for them because he's so strong. He's the one that's shutting them down right now. But without him, there's not really much they can do. Mundo can tank as much as he wants to, but there's no damage coming in here. So it's all on the Lux, basically, to keep the team from just losing turret after turret here. And the Trindamir really hasn't been able to get the uh, the pressure on the side lane that perhaps they were hoping for coming in this one. So Meridian are relying on Lux to keep them in this one right now. Yubi is the only strong point they have and uh, right now, the Trinity just isn't really ready to start pressuring much in the bot lane at all. And he's gone for the full split push with the Flash and Ghost. He doesn't have a TP to join, so going the side lane is always risky. And if he can't take down the objectives, then it's really not something he can do. And that seems to be the plan right now. Just keep him here while uh, keep him topside so we can get to the Baron in case something happens. And the goal here for Meridian is UV 
once again, buying enough time for the rest of the team to become relevant. You know, eventually that Trinomir will have that side lane pressure. Eventually, Mundo will be this unkillable tank. The only question mark that still remains for me is unfortunately this Ezreal. Has had a very rough game, borderline abysmal, as another fight is going to ensue. Looking for Yubi to take down the Ezreal already. They're on top of the Lux, but she is going to go golden inside the Redemption. Same on the backside. Swain is right on top of her. Once again, Jumperu is able to take down Yubi. Mundo now the only one left alive, very tanky, but as you said, not enough damage, and the tides have turned. Diverville is winning these fights. Yeah, and that's again, they found the engage here. You just talked about the Ezreal struggling this game. You saw as well some of the other members not doing as great here. And once they get into true 5 fight, there's just a huge advantage. He does uh, finish his VR mana 30 minutes into the game. Yeah, generally you wanted that to complete it already, and now the Trindamir running out of his ult. And that's another one here. So now the inner turret should go down. And inhibitor turret probably will stay up. There's only three members here. So unlikely Diverville will be able to get it. And they're just going to back off, not risk it, while their uh, jungler takes the dragon. So a smart move there. Um, but yeah, that team fight, Yubi doesn't have the damage to, to you know, to deal with all five members. And, and right now, the Ezreal doesn't provide enough damage to deal with any others. And, and Trinimir just really isn't a team fighting champion. It's not what he does. And uh, once you get to that state here, it's very tough to deal with, so it's important, I think, the rest of the game, just avoid a 5-5 ever. I think Viridian, there's no way they really win it now because all the item completions have come in and they're so far behind in that regard. Well, yeah, and look at the composition from Diverville. I mean, when you're talking about Yubi needs to stay safe, you're staying safe against five diving champions. And Akali, and a Lee Sin, a Swain, a Kaisa, and a Leona, all five of those champions have ways of locking you down, jumping up in your face, and just making your life a nightmare. And, you know, if this was a front to back, you know, maybe Maokai, maybe we've got like a Sejuani jungle and like we're really talking that kind of team fight, I think Yubi could shine. But because all of these champions are so adept at diving on to a given target, it can be difficult. Yubi is ultimate getting baited out there. Masterful play there by Jumperu. Kaisa into the back line. Trinmere pops his ult very early. A good stun by the Morgana, but it's not going to be enough as Diverville just destroys these fights once again. Is able to find three trades back, none. And now they're looking for the Baron. And Jumperu with an amazing insect there to knock Yubi back in. That's all an insect really means, is just kicking someone back into your team. They find Yubi, and once he's down again, Fight's just kind of lost from there from Meridian. Maybe a hero, hero steal, yeah. Flash. He might try to steal. Flash is into the pit. Can he actually get the smite? Oh. No, it's going to be Diverville taking it down. That Baron was at 50 HP. But it is going to go to Jumperoo. And one more takedown on their side means now a 9,000 gold lead with the Baron under their belt. One dragon away from the soul. It's looking like it might be a 2-0 championship. Yeah, this this is tough to come back from now with the Baron, but really, this has been an amazing game from Meridian. I, they have done such a good job. I know I wouldn't be, have the mental fortitude to come back after that game won, but for them to come back and put together a performance like this, really amazing stuff from them. Obviously, they've, they've made mistakes here as well, but this game looks so much... They look like a completely different team, to be honest with you. I would love to see a game three. Well, may, <laughs> hey, if Meridian if Meridian wants to go to game three, uh, it's okay. Well, they, it, they can win. It's just the difference that we've seen between Meridian game one and two. You know, it makes me think that game one might not have been really the team that they want to be, the team that they think they can be. And so I feel like they, I would love to see them have one more shot to really look at this game, say, how can we improve? And maybe if we see as much of an improvement from game one to game two as we do from game two to game three, Meridian would be a scary team. Well, they would just beat everyone. They would beat everyone. The, the, the difference between game one and two is, is astronomical. astronomical. Best word to describe that. It is just incalculable how much better they've been here. And if, if they could do that again, that'd be insane. But now they've still got their base to defend here. And the game's certainly not over yet. It's not looking great. Here's Jumperu, but he's not going to be able to find it yet. So maybe they can hang on. Akali there continuing to bully the Trindamir under his own turret. One has already fallen as you see Jumperu jumping away from that Lux ultimate. Is on a very short cooldown, especially with that one Cloud Dragon inventory already almost half done. But Silver is fully taken down there as the Kaisa is just going absolutely ham. Another insect 
Jumperoon now on a takedown spree is 4-3-9 and nine, as they are just breaking into the base. Now just standing still, might it just be a little BM. We actually see some connection issues. Could be the internet, they might have all DC'd. Oh no. They just all disconnected from I the game. I think they all just disconnected, They just all oh, reconnected no. to the game though too. They're back. That, that is They're actually back. so horrible. Let's hope this doesn't negatively impact them too much. They might just win the game here anyway. The Morgana gonna be taken down. From downtown comes Carmel. And now going golden is the Akali. One member left alive. The Ezreal just respawned. But this is it, the final defense from Meridian. It is here and now or never. And there you have it, folks. Diverville with a 2-0 victory will be your, MS, your MHSAA fall champions. Uh, that was a great series That was them. phenomenal. They played so well and even had a hiccup in game two. We're like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Hold on. Hold your well, horses here. We have here. a series on our hands. And then all of a sudden they were like, okay, no, now we're going to really kick it into <laughs> gear. Okay, we're getting serious now. And... Like we said, astronomical improvement from game one to game two for Meridian. It, it's unfortunate we don't get to see game three because we can't see how they actually improved. Obviously, Yubi was the star. That Lux bought so much time for her team, she was able to get a massive advantage. Even in game one, the Caitlyn was the one lane that really performed well in that game. But when it came down to brass tacks, it was the advantages that were gotten from the get-go in the side lanes. The Ezreal finishing the game with like under 50 CS was so hard to watch. And even up in the top lane, Trindamir, although he was 2-0-2, never able to find an advantage over that Akali enough so that he could actually put pressure on the map. And that was a, what was eventually the downfall. Yeah, certainly that was that was a rough spot for them. They just never got going, and that's you know credit to the enemy bot lane as well. Garamel having such a good performance both games. You know, start, start, all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, those Lux, like, well, hold on a second, buys a yeah. QSS, game turns around there. They, you know, solve that issue. And uh, really a great game for both teams. And I think this is a performance I'd be proud of yeah, to be absolutely. either school. That Coming back from game one, amazing. And obviously, Diaryville just the entire time played so, so well. And the effort from those guys, this was a fantastic series. This definitely was. And what a way to close out the day. Thank you to everybody for watching. Thank you so much to play versus once again our sponsor the ones putting together all of this and making it possible they've been doing work across the country with these you know high school championships creating these new leagues making a new sport that is esports allowing these high school students to participate to compete to really have their time to shine that's what we saw here today you can see the bracket how they made their way there the warrior alphas from uh D Dibble and Diabreville. Diabreville. <laughs> I'm sorry. They have a tough name they to pronounce. They have a tough it's, name. It's, it's tricky. But uh, they did a great job here. Both teams coming through a, a long gauntlet here. And, uh, you know, you saw tonight where that, that sort of war of attrition, that war of attrition where they you know, went from game one to game two. They had to recover, and, and both teams were able to do so. And uh, unfortunately, we don't get to see game three, but a fantastic series and uh, really impressive. Congratulations to those guys. Fortunately, though, this is not all that we get to see from Play Versus. We are going to have more matches throughout the week. Tomorrow, we're going to be coming back with some more Rocket League and Smite. And if you liked what you saw here today and you're interested in playing for Play Versus, your high school could be the next Warrior Alphas up there on the stage. They have signups open for their spring 20 or for their fall 2020 season as they are currently in the spring season. Um, so just go to playvs.com, play versus playvs.com if you're interested in signing up for your own team. But that is going to wrap it up here for us tonight. We saw some great games today, some Rocket League, some League of Legends. Thank you so much to Mississippi and to Play Versus for coming out and competing. It was an absolute blast. I hope all of you enjoyed. We'll be back to tomorrow for some more Rocket League and some more League of Legends. So make sure you stay followed to the channel so you can catch all of that action. But good night, everybody. We'll see you. I think a lot of students have just gotten another sense of how to belong and how to create relationships outside of what were the traditional avenues. And a lot of my students talk about how they feel safe in the esports program, and that's their family, that's their community. And I think that esports gives kids a future that they might otherwise not have. Man, I wish that had been available when I was in high school.